Hello and welcome to RLT Home Red Light Therapy. When we say that these devices are built from the ground up using scientific data, what do we mean? What exactly have we done? How do you know that these devices are truly state of the art and the most therapeutic combination of wavelengths and performance modes in the world? So in this video, I'm gonna go through the process that we took. It's a long elaborate process using thousands of studies but I'm going to explain how we've used that data to develop these devices from the ground up. Let's get into it. Please note this is not medical advice and a qualified healthcare professional must be consulted before use. So we began with Vladimir Heiskenen's photobiomodulation sheet in which he has compiled various photobiomodulation or red light therapy or low level laser therapy studies conducted around the world and on, 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 on animals, on, uh, t in test tubes, in humans. So here is that sheet, which you can find in, on this page where we list the 512 conditions studied in human trials. If you go to this page on our blog, then you can look at the original sheet over here. Now, coming back to this sheet, you can see that he has written down and documented 8,980 studies. Now, here is what we did. We took all of this data, we cleaned it up, and we put it in a large language model AI, the most advanced model that was available at the time, which was the O3 by OpenAI. And we found that the results were very mixed. The data was so wide and it was so um, varied across different test subjects that it did not make any sense. For example, there would be some data saying that you know a certain wavelength reduces the side of size of a tumor in cancer but then there would be contradictory studies saying well no the the size of the tumor has been seen to increase in mice for example so we were like going nowhere with it so here's what we did we narrowed this whole list of 8000 odd studies down to only ones done on humans so what we did was we removed the in vitro we removed anything that was not human, like reviews and rats and mice and everything. And we came, we narrowed it down to oh, another thing is that in, in this sheet, he's done a very good job on showing whether the study was effective, had no result, or was mildly effective. So what he's done is he's color coded these studies. And you can see that the green ones have been successful, which means they helped the condition that was being targeted, and the red ones had no effect. And the orange ones had some effect, but not as good as it could have potentially been. So what we did was we narrowed it, the studies down to only human, and we came across this database. Now, in this database, we had the successful ones, the mildly successful, and the not so successful. Um, so in that, uh, data set, again, we were having conflicting results. So then we narrowed it down to only studies that had been 100% successful, conducted on humans, and had real use cases in real life. Now, this was the data that we came out with. So this is now a list of 1,861 studies that we narrowed down. Now what we did was we fed this data into the large language model AI, and this is what it came back with. So we found after inputting that data into the AI, we found that certain wavelengths are doing really well for certain categories of conditions. For example, the skin and anti-aging, the 633 nanometer, 660 have been extraordinary. Like the success rates of these are incredible. Similarly, with the pain and inflammation sort of, side of things, the 830 and 633 and 1064 nanometers are incredible. Similarly, for mental health and brain, for example, the 1064 shines, right? Including the 810. One thing that needs to be sort of borne in mind, which we took into consideration, is that a lot of these wavelengths have been started to be studied in the in the last few years. For example, the 850 and 660 have been around and have been studied for a lot, you know, a very long period of time. 
That is why if you have a panel from, let's say, 2020, it's going to be 660 and 850 nanometers. And then as years progressed and as more research happened around the world, uh, we found that there are other wavelengths that are more therapeutic in nature and can do better than just the 660 and 850. That is why we were the first to pioneer multi-wavelength panels. And we came out with, with a device uh, two years ago, which had six wavelengths, but the percentages of wavelengths are different, were different from what they are now. And the reason is that as more and more data appears in the science of things, the, the more accurate we can get with our devices. So coming back to how we built them, what we found was if we were to break the device down into these four channels with the reds in one channel, so these two wavelengths were the most effective red wavelengths across the 1861 studies, these three NIRs were the most effective, and the 1064 short wave IR was the most successful for deeper penetration. And we added the blue for its antibacterial benefits, particularly in acne, skin conditions, and in wound healing. So based on all of this data, we came out with uh, these percentages. And we said, well, if there was uh, a skin and anti-aging performance mode in our device, then it should have 80% reds, 20% of these three wavelengths, and it doesn't require any short wave IR, the 1064 or 1060. So that's how we built this mode. And based on all the data that we saw, saw here in this sheet, uh, the large language model AI, which was the most advanced at the time and still is, came out with saying that these are the conditions that are most likely to benefit based on the data available. Similarly, the pain and inflammation, wound healing, what, what does it need to be? How long does the session need to be? And then we built in some more advanced functionalities into it. For example, with pain, inflammation, and wound healing, you do need the blue light for wound healing, but you don't need it for inflammation and deep-rooted pain. So what we did was in our version two devices, we switched off, we switched off the uh, blue for two minutes, then turned it on for a minute, and we repeated this for 15 minutes. So this is how we've built these modes. And, and, and now you can see that these are truly developed from real science data. Let's go a bit further. So of all the 1860 odd studies, we found that the 660 nanometers was the most studied. There were a total of 473 studies on the 660. And also, it was a very successful wavelength. So if you, if you take the successful plus somewhat successful against all studies, then it's a whopping 78.4%, which gives us very high confidence that this is a wavelength that has been studied very well, very extensively, and we want to include in our devices. And we want to include it in a higher percentage. Similarly, 830 was the second most effective wavelength we found. The 808, 810, they are bioequivalent wavelengths because they're so close to each other in nanometerage that they have near identical effects. So we included the 810. Then the 633, and 630 are again bioequivalent wavelengths. So in this, the green ones are the ones that we put in the device, and the orange ones are the bioequivalent ones. Closely bioequivalent are the orange ones, and the lighter orange are those that are bioequivalent, but they are slightly further away in nanometrage. So this is how this was the sort of the crux of the data. Now, how do we use that data to build our devices? We decided that having the majority wavelengths as 660 and 850 nanometers was not enough. We needed to have higher percentage densities of the other wavelengths, particularly the 810, for example, or the 1064. So what we did was based on, again, all the studies together and with a, with a thought in mind that what would the most therapeutic overall device look like, we came out with these percentages and we've built them into these devices. So for example, the Elite, which is an 864 LED device, it has 48 blue lights, 
168-633 nanometer light, 168-660. Now, 633 and 630 are the same. So if you read 630 somewhere, that's why. And this is how we've come about these devices. And then after multiple iterations, the total spectrum series was born. I just wanted to make this clear because we write this uh, at various parts on the website and people do question on what do you mean that by these are derived from science. And I hope that this video makes it very clear on how these are science driven. And while we are at the topic of science, there are two other things that are important where we're very different from other companies. One is that we use a 30 degree beam angle. Now a 30 degree beam angle means that the beam of light that's coming out of the panel is a narrower beam compared to let's say a 60 degree beam angle. Yeah, or a 90 degree beam angle. These beams are much wider. So what happens with a 30 degree beam angle is that you have to be at a certain distance away from the panel for the light to get broad enough to, to reach your body and to cover a decent amount of area. Now, the advantage of that is that because every LED in a one foot wide panel is a 30 degree beam angle, the wastage of light, if you are a foot away or two feet away from the panel is minimal because most of the light is contained within that little area and it will most of it will be absorbed by the body. Another positive effect of that is that the question of any EMF goes away. We've been tested for zero EMF at six inches or more, but at one foot being our minimal recommended distance, there is just no question of any EMF. The problem with a wider beam angle is that you have to be very close to the panel. So for, imagine a 60 degree beam angle, a one foot wide 60 degree beam angle. By the time you are two feet away from it, most of the light will be going to the periphery being wasted. So that was a conscious choice that we've made to use a 30 degree beam angle. That's number one. And number two, where we're different is from a lot of other companies is that we use a single chip LED. Now we use a five watt single chip LED. What that means is that host to a dual chip LED, the full five watt power is allocated to one wavelength. Now, the advantage of that clearly is that because of the much higher irradiance per wavelength, the depth of penetration is more. And that is why you will see that in our documentation, if you go to the usage guide, where by the way, you'll also see a link to the studies that I spoke about earlier and how we built the devices, you'll see all of that on the usage page. You will see that if we are comparing therapeutic effectiveness based on real science data at a distance of one foot, two foot, three foot, and four foot away, that's 12, 24, 36, and 48 inches away, number one, we will have, well, we arguably have, because it's been tested, the highest irradiance compared to most other brands. Uh, and number two, that you are able to do your therapy in a way where you're not sort of sticking very close to a device in a very uncomfortable position. You could be a foot away, relaxed, moving about, stretching, and still get the desired therapy. So these are another two considerations to take into account when you're comparing us with other brands, because that's how we're different too. Well, I hope that this entire science video made sense. If you have any questions regarding this, please pop into our live chat. We're always here to help. We are known for our customer support. Um, and we'll be very happy to hear from you and help you. Thank you. Take care.